Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome you to our uh, conference in partnership with the CFA Institute. Um, as an economist, I've been excited ever since this theme was put together, which is building an environment for long-term value creation. Um, to me, this is just how do we deal with the short-termism that has become so prevalent uh, and so uh, germane to everything that happens in organization. I was talking to Paul uh, a little while ago, um, who's the president and global CEO of the CFA Institute. In terms of how do you actually get a community to start thinking about anything different from the quarter by quarter approach to life? Uh, and there is so much evidence to the contrary but we, um, as people as in society, but more importantly as people in organizations and in the finance community, are constantly looking to justify our actions based on the kind of rewards we will get from the market. Uh, I'm going to say something quite provocative, and I'm sure there will be lots of people in this room who will disagree with me, but I think markets have a mind of their own. It's very difficult to show for every 20 companies that uh, uh, the guy who wrote Good to Great, uh, Jim, Co Jim Collins, every 20 companies that he shows are rewarded by the market. I can show you 20 that did the right thing and were not rewarded by the market. So what are you going to use to guide your behavior as you go forward? Um, you know, the example of companies like Coke and Nestle and all of these others who invest in their communities, who invest in recharging groundwater, who invest in the health of people around them because they're a medical devices company. Nothing spares you if you make one wrong step. 20 years or 15 years of a certain kind of behavior cannot be continued only because you expect to be rewarded by the market. And I think we are sitting at a time where the world is recalibrating. Post the financial crisis in the US, I think everybody has to sit back and say, what are going to be their guiding principles? How are they going to think about running their businesses? And for what reasons will they continue to do what they do? Um, I obviously don't have the answers, and I have the lucky job of asking questions. Uh, so. I think this is a time for the community to actually start thinking that suppose this was not about the markets rewarding you. How would you as an organization behave? And what would you use to guide your behavior? Is there a way in which one can build a fraternity that does the right thing despite the fact that it's not going to show you short-term results? And how do you actually convince and organization and a group of people to be able to cope with the fact that the returns may not be immediate, but this is indeed the right thing to do going forward. Because like Kane said, in the long term, we are all dead. So how do you inspire people to do things that don't show rewards in the short term, but will reward you in the long term when none of us are going to be around? And I'm stretching to make the point, but the truth is, that we all have our own sense of what is the right time period to assess our performance, to assess outcomes, to assess returns. Um, I'm absolutely delighted that we are going to actually have a conversation here today that says, what are some of the things that we can do that focus on the long term and can avoid the perils of being stuck in terms of the short term and its, and its results. We have a great lineup of speakers, um, and um, we are doing this in partnership with the CFA Institute. I have great people from there who are going to talk to you about their experiences, their thinking, and what guides them in the, in the process of thinking about this issue, and will we'll share their thoughts with all of us as a community. Uh, I'd like to invite Aarti Porwal, Director of Society Relations uh, India for the CFA Institute, who's going to set the context and talk to you about why they thought it was important to, uh, to partner with, the CFO, with CFO India and our magazine. Please join me in welcoming Aarti Porwal.
Thank you, Anuradha. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of CFA Institute, it really gives me great pleasure to welcome you to this morning's discussion. Your presence is a sign of the fact that you have great interest in the subject matter and concern about it. At CFE Institute, as a global association of investment professionals that sets the standards of professional excellence and credentials, we are concerned about all issues that impact long-term value creation and the value delivered to investors, the industry, and the society as a whole. As an organization, we champion for ethics, ethical behavior of investment managers, professionals, as well as the markets, and are a respected source of knowledge for the global financial community, which includes our 138,000 members in 148 countries. It's therefore, we partner with like-minded institutions like CFO India, so that we can direct thought leaderships on issues and that impact the market and influence the behavior, hopefully, of the industry in the market for long-term value creation for society as a whole. Your opinion on this matter is therefore very important to us. As a beginning of this subject and as a discussion to start the conversation, we also conducted with CFO India just before this event a dipstick survey amongst CFOs to find out the opinion they hold for this on this subject matter. We have found some interesting output out of that, which we shall share with you today during our discussions. We have an eminent panel here which will begin the discussions today, but we hope that that would just be the beginning and that you would later participate and provide your opinion to make this an enriching conversation. Thank you so much for sparing the morning time today on a working day to be here. To begin this event, I would like to introduce to you Mr. Paul Smith, President and CEO, CEO of CFA Institute, who will give us his opinion and start the conversation today. Paul Smith is the Managing Director, and for, is the President and CEO of CFA Institute since January 2015. He joined the institute in 2012 and became, was the Managing Director of Asia Pacific overseeing the operations of China and India. He later assumed leadership of the Institutional Partnership Division, which was responsible for engagement with key industry groups. Mr. Smith has extensive leadership experience in the investment management industry and has held a variety of positions in major financial centers over, th over his 30-year career. He started his career in asset management at Hermitage International, an alternative fund management company, progressively taking up roles and increasing his responsibility across Europe, which included London, Paris, and Dublin, over his 11-year career, and he finally became the CEO of that organization. He moved to Asia in 1996, naturally because the region was taking off, and that's where the action was. Paul generally likes to follow action wherever it goes. Paul was promoted as the global head of HSBC funds after he, the organization was taken over, that he was working in, which is the Bank of Bermuda was taken over by HSBC. He has also pursued an entrepreneurial role and most recently was the founder and CEO of the Hong Kong-based hedge fund investment management for a for investment management firm called Asia Alternative Asset Partners. Paul has been featured in the Asian Investor magazine as, the 25, as amongst the 25 most influential people in the Asian hedge fund market. So Paul will provide today his perspective of not only CFA, what CFA Institute's opinion is about this subject, but also his opinion as a person who's been actively involved in the industry and his from drawing out from his extensive experience. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Paul Smith. Thank you, Artie. Thank you, Anuradna. 
Um, it's, uh, it's great to be here, and thank you all for coming this morning. Um, it's uh, an honor for me to be here with you. Um, because this isn't our usual audience, the CFA Institute really is an institute that is built around a core of investment management professionals. I thought I'd just take two minutes just to sort of set the scene about the Institute itself and tell you a little bit uh, about us. Um, one of the most distressing things in my role um, is that uh, we are best known for holding an exam. Um, when you go out onto the street and you ask the average young Indian, uh, you know, what do you know about the CFA Institute, they'll say, well, you're those awful people that torture us once a year um, during an examination process. And, and that's true, uh, we do. Uh, we torture about 20,000 young Indians a year uh, going through that CFA Institute examination process. But really, that is the entry ticket to joining a profession. And really what we are, what the CFA Institute is, is a professional body for people involved in the investment management industry. And we take that role uh, very, very seriously uh, indeed. As Arti just said, we have um, about 140,000 members worldwide. Um, we started in the US. Uh, we're a not-for-profit organization. But now we are genuinely global. We have over 24,000 members in Asia Pacific. And I'm pleased to say about 1,300 of those here in India, where we have charter holders in about seven major cities. So Mumbai, very definitely the biggest. Uh, but Delhi, Chennai, Hyderabad, Bangalore, Pune, Calcutta um, are uh, very much uh, centers of influence for us here in India. Basically, wherever financial services are pursued, uh, CFA charter holders are. 1,300 in a country of India's size uh, is really very, very low. Uh, in, in the United States of America, uh, a country with uh, you know, a quarter of the population probably of India, uh, we have, just for the sake of comparison, we have 66,000 charter holders. So we have a long, long way to go uh, in India before we can truly penetrate this industry. And the, the, the point I really want to make to you today is that uh, in India, um, you really don't need qualifications to be an investment manager. And for us, as a professional body, uh, that really is uh, a terrible thing to have to admit that um, you know, in a lot of countries that we operate in, it's true to say it is easier to become a, a fund manager than it is to become a hairdresser. And if you, if you think about that within a professional context, uh, it's really quite, um, quite frightening that uh, if you went to a doctor for instance, you would be horrified if that doctor didn't have a medical certificate. But in the finance industry, one in 10 fund managers has no credential, has no professional qualification. And so we take building the investment profession very seriously. Uh, if we are to address some of the issues um, uh, that we've talked about and that we're going to talk about, and Anurada mentioned in her opening remarks, if we're going to address those issues, then we have to improve the quality of this industry. We have to improve our professionalism. And one thought I'd like to leave you with today is, well, what is a profession and why, why do you need a profession? And again, if you go back to thinking about doctors, lawyers, accountants, people who we would all recognize as professionals, what is at the core of professionalism is service to others. That you serve your client, you serve your patient first, and yourself second. And that really is the basis of ethical behavior. And at the CFA Institute, everything that we teach, everything that we do is founded upon ethics. And why do we need a profession? Well, I think in the investment management world, it's pretty obvious, really. There is a tremendous asymmetry of information between professionals such as ourselves and the general public. And also, what we do is vitally important for the general public. We look after their savings. We make sure that they can save for retirement. We make sure that they can put their kids through college. We make sure that they can pay off their mortgage. So we have a tremendous social purpose 
and this tremendous asymmetry of information at the same time. And so if we are to build trust between ourselves and our clients, if we are to build a sustainable industry going forward, then professional conduct has to be at the heart of everything that we do. So we take that responsibility very seriously. And today's topic really segues very nicely from that setup. Finance has a social purpose. Uh, I think one of the challenges over the last 10 years is that in the general public's mind, when um, the man on the street looks at finance professionals, they see a profession, an industry that really serves itself first and its clients second. And we need to alter that perception. We have a social purpose. The purpose of finance is to help societies and individuals within societies meet their financial goals. And that is done by making sure that savings are directed to infrastructure projects, um, to uh, companies that can help build a country. And that is nowhere more apparent than in the developing world. And I think our professional purpose is always, in a country like India, very much at the forefront of our mind. We know that developing countries cannot develop without a finance industry that serves directly society's needs, that helps direct capital to where capital is required. And um, that really is the core of what we do as a profession. So today's subject matter, trying to connect those dots up between the investment management profession and what actually goes on in terms of investor behavior is one that is really very, very central to where we live and a subject matter that we're passionately interested in. So thank you very much for your attendance uh, today. I'm very much in, uh, looking forward to the debate uh, and uh, to obviously the interaction with you all uh, as we go forward over the next hour. Thank you. Uh, thank you. That uh, Our panel today is going to talk about the risks of short-termism, as, as Paul alluded to it, and how do you build an environment for long-term value creation. Uh, I'd like to invite our panelists for today, and I hope that we'll have a fantastic conversation uh, given their wide-ranging experience. I'd like to invite Yatrik Vin. He's the CFO of the National Stock Exchange. If you could join me on the stage. He's the CFO at the National Stock Exchange and has served as a CFO and Senior Vice President um, for several years now. Uh, Sunil Singhania, he's the Chief Investment Officer at the Reliance Mutual Fund. He's not here yet? Okay. Uh, he's been, <laughs> I think, at some crossing for the last 10 or 15 minutes, so I'm hoping that he will be here as we get started. Vijay Paratkar, Vice President, m and at Mahindra and Mahindra. Um, as all of you will know, uh, Mahindra and Mahindra is one of the most active uh, large conglomerates in this space. And I think how they think about their, uh, their investments and their transactions will add great value to the panel. Uh, Gerard said, partner indirect tax at EY. Um, he used to be the senior vice president at Reliance Geo uh, as they were embarking on their 4G uh, project. And uh, if I can invite Paul Smith, uh, global CEO of the CFA Institute. I'd also like to invite Vidu Shekhar, the country head of the CFA Institute, who's going to moderate this panel. Uh, please join me in welcoming all of our panelists on stage. Uh, we have about half an hour, Vidu, so I'd uh, request you to uh, you know, Start. get started, and then we'll open the floor to question and answer. We need one more chair. Yeah, I, I'm wondering, do you want to moderate from here because yeah. I'll go down? Oh, okay. Do you want to just okay. do that or? I can do that. I can. Might be yeah, a bit of a yeah, typist. Sure. Uh, so, do you want me to return your mic now or uh, hang on to it? <laughs> Some confusion there, yeah. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> all right. Okay. So, this puts me in a spot. I was hoping to be sitting there. <laughs> But in any case, you know, whenever I feel embarrassed, I can just duck down from the podium. So, <laughs> so thank you, thank you, Anuradha, thank you, everybody. 
Uh, and we've been uh, planning this discussion uh, for some time now, and uh, uh, we we've, and we've been talking to the CFO uh, India uh, on uh, some of these mutual uh, areas of mutual interest, and we thought that this would be a very nice setting for us to bring these two communities together, the uh, community of investment managers and the community of uh, CFOs. So this uh, is a small room and we are not many. So we intended this as a open interactive uh, session. I, you know, I, I know that many of you have opinions on uh, the, the things that we are talking about. What we will do is that we'll spend a little time uh, setting up the conversation with the people on the dais and uh, once the conversation gets going, then we will open it up to you, not as a Q&A, not just as a Q&A, uh, but uh, you're free to express your opinion, bring in new points and so on, because our intention is to start a conversation today on which we are going to uh, continue building. And what we want to do in the long run is to create a community. That's what uh, we were discussing, Anuradha and Paul and I, just before this event that uh, if we are able to do things together uh, and bring one voice, uh, then uh, we have a better chance of being, uh, being heard and being influential uh, as CFOs, CF, CIOs, as analysts, and so on and so forth. So just to start, uh, start with, uh, to set the stage, I want to ask uh, the panelists uh, what they mean by the word short term and the word long term. So the question is, if you can give an example from your, uh, from your experience as a CFO, uh, you know, what, uh, what do you think is uh, short term for you, you know, in terms of time, in terms of, uh, in terms of a decision or whatever, say something from your experience. Uh, so do you want to start, Jairaj, since yeah, you're I can start. here? Uh, the way I have looked at things is, ultimately, it is the ambition or aspirations of the promoters, as well as the investors or the stakeholders which determines what is long term and short term. And it also depends on the kind of business that you are in. So if you are in a brick and mortar business setting up a steel plant, you are in a business of setting up a telecom venture where you have to set up the network across the country, or if you are in an e-commerce company, the whole definition to my mind of long term and short term will be different. So it could be 10 plus years, 20 years, 15 years for a brick and mortar business, and it could be five, seven years as long-term for an e-commerce platform. Something that I thought could be a way of looking at things. What about you, uh, Yatrik? Uh, you are in a long-term infrastructure business. Uh, yeah, I think uh, just taking on from what Jairaj was mentioning is that uh, ultimately every business has, uh, industry has its own business cycle. So within that business cycle, it could be three years, five years, but to my mind, when you say long term, it has to be at least eight to 10 years plus. Because when we look at long term value building, it is not something that one can really achieve in one year or two year or in one quarter. Because too much focus on short termism, which is actually the theme of the day, has its own uh, pitfalls in terms of creating shareholder value. So I think eight to 10 years is a sustained uh, measure of uh, whether we are building the value to the stakeholders or not. Uh, Jared, you want to talk about the uh, environment a little bit about, what, you know, how do you see the short term and long term issue? Uh, I would define uh, the short term or long term from a uh, different player's point of view. If you are talking about the promoter who is there in the business, for him, 20 years is possibly the long term, and he will not be talking about the short term at all, because he is a portfolio investor, basically. I, it, within, say, let's say 10 years or 15 years, if that business does not do well, then he has to seek a uh, next immediate opportunity to uh, evaluate whether he should be there in that business or not. Whereas if it's a private equity player, then for them, uh, it's a living in relationship, sorry for using that word, but uh, after five years, they would be thinking of exiting from the business. So for them, any business which matures within five or six years is a good business for them, whereas for portfolio investor like promoters, long-term promoter investment will be there for 
10, anywhere from 10 to 20 years. Can you say something from your own experience because you handle M&A at uh, uh, Mahindra? So uh, when you look at the different businesses in your own portfolio, um, how do you look at uh, uh, that? I would say from uh, Mahindra's experience, if you take an example of our auto components business, uh, completely built over inorganic acquisitions uh, straight away in from 2004 onwards. And uh, we found that in, 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 in uh, 2000, by the time we reach about 2014, given the cost structures that we have within the group, it may not be a sustainable business for us to remain as a majority player. So the call was taken clearly that, do you want to be a bigger portion of a smaller cake, or do you want to be a smaller portion of a bigger cake? And we chose the latter. And therefore, we went into minority, mm -hmm. but which means we stayed in the business, but the reins of the business were handed over to a person or organization uh, which is European organization, which is, which is considered to be very strict on uh, margin play. Mm -hmm. And that has yielded the results. And what was the combined valuation earlier is now the uh, quadrupled uh, within a year or two. So the call of, uh, I wouldn't say exiting, but the call of uh, getting into a minority position in auto components business for us uh, was fruitful. Interesting. Uh, Paul, I want to come to you and uh, ask you fra as an investment manager or someone representing the investment profession, uh, when you look at companies, um, how do you judge a company? Uh, you're looking at, say, you're looking at Mahindra's and you see the kind of decisions that they are taking. Um, uh, how, do you, how do you see whether a company is focused on the short term or the long term? And how does that affect your investment decision making? Yeah, I, I think um, I for us as, as investment analysts, as investment managers, everything starts with the financial statements, really. I mean, that's mm -hmm. our core, uh, uh, core start point. And so um, uh, clearly the way that financial statements uh, work, uh, Indian accounting standards, uh, in India's case, um, uh, GAP in the US, FASB, um, International Accounting Standards Board uh, requirements elsewhere. Those are the key things. So we look at capital expenditure, obviously. We look at the amount of money that's being spent in R&D. But increasingly, I think where the investment management profession is going as far as long-termism is concerned is to really try to weave in um, some of the longer-term uh, uh, constructs around uh, ESG, for instance. Um, so when we look at a company, um, we are interested in uh, uh, redundant assets, for instance, coal. Uh, if you're in that sort of industry, what are you doing uh, as far as uh, the way that you, uh, you treat your reserves? Um, uh, we're looking at financial inclusion uh, as an issue. Uh, we're looking at environmental degradation in general. Um, water usage, demographics, all of those things, increasingly the investment management profession is uh, looking at some of those long-term trends to weave into our analysis of uh, corporations. Uh, and I think that's, uh, that makes it a very uh, interesting moment as far as the investment management profession is concerned because those types of long-term things are no longer being looked at as separate subjects. They're really being uh, brought into the day-to-day -day analysis of any corporation. Um, so I think that's, that's interesting, and that's not to say that there aren't plenty, and, and we, we are not proponents of, of sort of long-term investing over short-term investing. There's, there's plenty of justification for short-term investing. Um, I think our analysis of this is that you have to, uh, as, uh, as Jay Raj says, you have to look at the company uh, look at what the company does, and then determine what factors are relevant for that particular entity. And so that's really where we come from uh, as investment professionals, Thanks. is to try to figure out uh, what some of those long-term factors are. And it's becoming more and more complex to do that because of these issues that um, lie over the top of most companies now, this, these social issues effectively. Thanks, Paul. Sunil, your market timing is very good, so you have arrived. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> just on cue. So we were uh, discussing the first question of what is short term and long term. And uh, after talking to the CFOs about what they think is short term and long term, uh, we were asked, going to ask you and Paul, uh, Paul's just responded, about how do you see companies, like when you look at a company, how do you determine whether the company is focused on the short term or the long term, and how does that impact your investment decision making? So frankly, you know, when you are sitting in front of the screen uh, and you see the ticker, long term is anything more than five minutes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> see, so. <laughs> uh, so I think yeah. uh, obviously, you know, yeah. uh, the cliched answer would be that long term is at least three to five years and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. But I think what is happening is that even on a fundamental basis, things are changing. You know, there's a lot of dynamism now in the businesses also. Uh, you know, everyone knows about disruption and disruptive technologies. The way you do business is changing. Uh, you know, the, the business models of the company might be disrupted, might be changed overnight. So I think though, you know, from an investment perspective, uh, you have to take a call of at least one business cycle. And one business cycle is typically three to five years to, you know, actually determine whether you would want to be invested in a company or not. There might be some events which might change your perspective. And these events are becoming more and, more and more dynamic as we move forward. However, uh, unfortunately, we are in this scenario, at least uh, as a portfolio investor, and you know, I sometimes uh, also feel a little bit, uh, you know, to some extent, some pity on the CEOs and the CFOs because they have to manage expectations on almost every quarter basis. So everyone talks about being a long-term investor, but quarterly Infosys declares quarter percent, half percent, more or less, the market swings are like six, seven, eight percent, and that's on a day-to-day -day basis. So I think, uh, uh, you know, while we can all argue that we have to invest in the long term, I think the, the need of the hour is that you can't ignore uh, the near term, you know. So that would so be good. my market. Uh, sort of good, good. So it's good that you walked in later because you didn't hear what the CFO said. And <laughs> I really love this contrast between five minutes and ten years. And, <laughs> and I think the, the answer we are hearing is it depends, uh, which is the case for, uh, for everything. And you've set up the next question for me, which is uh, uh, the issue of uh, quarterly um, you know, reporting and earnings guidance. So I first want to go back to the CFOs and ask them, how do they react? Because you feel pity for them. Do, do they feel pity? Like, uh, do you feel that you are you know, under the glare and uh, if only these guys go away and don't ask you to report every quarter, uh, your life would be much better? Uh, Vijay, you want to start? Yeah, Vin uh, doesn't bother about these things, so I know that. Uh, <laughs> sorry. Hmm. That's a difficult one to answer, a bit, really. But uh, yes, from the market perspective, uh, quarterly, uh, as Sunil has said, it does matter. But to my mind, uh, it doesn't matter to the company to an extent uh, that uh, they being the long-term players, there will be ups and downs in one particular uh, quarter or so. You take our businesses, they are vulnerable to uh, actually monsoon. So there are a couple of quarters which we will face, which are going to be tough if there is no monsoon. So ups and downs in the business in quarter for a long-term player like company, um, it, it, it doesn't really uh, matter to an extent. Uh, because even for a promoter, uh, the market capitalization is there on the papers. I mean, if tomorrow uh, Bill Gates even comes in the market and says that I want to encash my, uh, you know, some of the percentages, uh, he will lose his market cap. So, so for him, having a high market cap is at the back of the mind but to generate long-term value creation in the business, taking care of the disruptive technologies and variety of regulatory environments in which he is going to work with the competitors, knowing their competition matrix, that is more important for him or for any company for that matter uh, than uh, what is happening as a short-term blip, up or down in the quarter. Yes, it, it will, a market will, give its own weightage uh, for quarterly results. But so long as your long-term value growth is on the track, uh, it doesn't matter to a company 
uh, what happens in one or two quarters, to my mind. Do you agree with that, uh, Jairaj? Yeah. Uh, my view is slightly, I would say, different on this, that the purpose of a quarterly result, to my mind, is for the external investors, mm -hmm. and probably not the management, which actually does probably a daily reporting, or a weekly reporting, or even a bi-weekly reporting, or a monthly reporting, generally. All the MISs, all the BI tools which are devised, are for them to control the business minute to minute. So the quarterly results is for an external investor who is looking at a certain time frame within which on his investment returns whether they are adequate or not. As then Sunil mentioned, for him five minutes and more is also long term. So from that perspective, the quarterly results have a very limited, I would say, objective. And it's to bring transparency, corporate governance principles, and everybody to know what is happening within a company. But unfortunately, because of the technological platforms that are now available, the reactions to these quarterly results are happening in a few seconds or a few minutes. And then everybody starts doing the algorithmic trading. And whether that is investment is anybody's guess. That's actually trading and not even investment. So that's, that's the way I look at the objective and the result or the impact of the quarterly results. But yes, any management or promoter would definitely not look at quarterly numbers for their direction to change unless they have limited objectives of either raising funds or they want to themselves exit or they are going for big expansions and they want to really borrow at lower rates of interest, then that kind of a manipulation is something which can creep in. Yeah, so when we did the uh, CFO survey, about uh, 41 uh, uh, to this survey, and uh, a substantive number of them said that uh, they, they do, uh, the, that the quarterly result does impact their decision making. So it was a simple question, uh, and uh, you know, they, they, they said, yes, it does. Uh, we really haven't dug deeper into how much does it, like, and so on. But you know, we keep hearing about this thing about what should we show for this quarter, and because uh, it's in the hands of the CFO, <laughs> right? <laughs> so I want to go back to Yatrik and ask you, you know, in your, uh, if you wear your hat as a regulator representing the exchange, um, how do you, you have seen the behavior of companies all, all through these years. What is it that you have seen uh, uh, has changed from what it was maybe 10, 15 years ago and what it is today in the way the companies behave and how does the exchange look at these things? Yeah, sure. Uh, I think two or three important things uh, when we have to look at short-termism and uh, focus on quarter-on-quarter -quarter results and uh, regulatory changes. I think two important nuances which come out is that uh, one is the what is the promoter shareholding? Because if promoter shareholding is substantive, say 80% plus, then probably the promoter or uh, the strategic investors may not be much concerned about quarter on quarter results and performance. Because then their way of measuring the business success is much different than the pure stock prices. But if the promoter shareholding is very less, say 25%, 30%, then there's a 70% of the larger public community which is actually invested into your business. In that case, probably the pressure on the management and the behavior of the leaders in the business around what should be the investment and whether they should have a short-term approach or long-term approach or uh, whether particular uh, projects need to be undertaken or not or what should be the capital structuring I think it's a completely different uh, ball game in that sense. And then over a period of time, we have observed that businesses do start taking short-term approach to the business. Second one is the point of uh, executive compensation. Because increasingly as we have executive compensations which are linked to the market prices of the shares, or traditional accounting and financial uh, parameters, which are largely only evaluating the steady state historical performance and which are not driven out of value creation. 
the behavior that we have observed is that everybody then starts talking about one year, two year. Because the compensation is linked to those performance parameters and there is no enough guidance or communication around what value the businesses are creating. So any investor today when he looks at and as Paul in his opening remarks was mentioning that when an investor wants to start investing, the first thing and the most important thing that they look at is the balance sheet. But the accounting and reporting and balance sheets, they have very limited communication about the success of the business. Because when we talk of value creation, it is something beyond the traditional financial ratio. So that is second part of it. And third part of it is that even the survey that it indicates, it's a reality. That if quarter on quarter performance is not looking good or if your peers in the industry are having certain performances which are ahead of you, you would have that peer pressure to come back on track. And at that point in time, probably you may take certain decisions and actions which are not into long term value creation. So yes, behaviors do indicate that people are short termism. Also people want that value creation. So it's not something which is a straightforward answer to a particular question. But I suggest or I think that in long run, the markets reward those businesses which are on a sustained value creation basis, the businesses which keep value as an important parameter than just looking at the return on investments or return on net worth or profitability ratios. So that's my... But, but you have, have you seen a behavior change in the companies over a period of time? Or it was the same uh, earlier and uh, what it is now? See, because uh, Jairaj talked about uh, this whole trading culture and say we use the word casino capitalism and all that stuff. So has that uh, impacted the, you know, if, if you look at it from a listing agreement and uh, what they report, point of view, have you seen? Yeah, actually the structure of listing agreement and now uh, uh, LODR, the new uh, uh, listing uh, avatar of li uh, traditional listing agreement, all the disclosures that the companies are supposed to make, the financial disclosures in specific, are all revolving around the top line, bottom line and the performance parameters which are traditional accounting ratios. So if those are the disclosures that you have to give in the market, I think, yes, people would tend to behave in a fashion where those numbers will look good. So there has been a shift in the overall yes, behavior. Sure to, uh, you know, uh, over a period of time, at least I personally have observed that fundamentally there are three pillars which uh, which uh, any group can create a long-term value for the shareholders. And to my mind, those pillars are related to transparency. Today, we call it as uh, corporate governance norms. Uh, the simplicity, which is nothing but uh, core competencies, and uh, whatever the business model is, are you consistent uh, in, in, in maintaining uh, whatever you do in the business? If you are rigorously sticking to these three fundamental pillars, then I do not think why you will not be creating a value over a period of time to the shareholders. Take for example, companies and groups which are strong in their corporate governance over a period of time, world over, the statistics say that they enjoy higher price earning ratios uh, for their shareholders. So to my mind, in the long term, uh, this is what is very critical for wealth creation. So, yeah, so I think, I'll uh, open it up, uh, so I'll just open it up to the audience in a minute for the interaction. Uh, but uh, I want to uh, ask you and then Sunil, um, you know, do you, it's, it's a matter of communication as well, right? You may have all these things internally, but your investors are looking at you and they are making up their mind about how your company works. Uh, how do you do that, right? The, uh, as uh, Yatvik said, the quarterly numbers are just earnings and, uh, you know, uh, top line, bottom line, and so on. Uh, my, my one line answer would be that uh, investors and stock markets are extremely smart to mm -hmm. realize which is a group which is there with 
good ethical practices and which is the group which is not. So they are very smart enough to distinguish between these two. Okay. Yeah, I just so, have some yeah, small yeah, sure. statistics to what Vijay says that uh, some three years back, we had done one uh, uh, research internally in NSE and top 279 companies using certain parameters that we had chosen and then we had bucketed those companies into three groups on CG score, corporate governance score. It was less than 45, 45 to 55 and above 55. And on one hand, we put bucketed these 279 companies in the, on the CG score. And on the other hand, for last 10 years, we had looked at their financial numbers and then identified the pattern. And we found that the companies which had CG score above 55, that is those top ranking companies, there were some uh, 21 companies out of that, about 10%. They had consistently outperformed not only their peers within the same industry, but across different industries, those financial numbers in terms of profitability, the growth ratios, the return on investment, the dividend that they had rewarded to the shareholders, the continuous uh, bonuses that they could give to the shareholders, they had actually outperformed. So there is a very strong correlation between what is the governance score and governance practices in a particular business and how eventually investors look at those companies and reward it. So market rewards when you have a consistent good ethical behavior. Data says so. So Sunil, do you react to quarterly numbers at all? Or? See, I'll just play a little bit mm. of a devil's advocate here also. It's an interesting <laughs> discussion. See, one is, uh, you know, uh, very clearly there is no denying the fact that corporate governance, disclosures and all make a lot of difference uh, in terms of valuation. Uh, first to Mr. Paratskar's point of good groups, you know, good groups have also made bad decisions. And a lot of good groups, even in India, uh, including the Tatas, including the Birlas, including the Ambani's, in their respective businesses have made bad decisions which have destroyed tremendous value in a few companies. So just because a group is ethical and follows corporate governance, will value be created? It's not necessarily yes, because uh, you know, as shareholders, whether you are a majority shareholder or minority shareholder, you have every right and you have every, uh, you know, uh, it's a fiduciary duty also to ensure that the decisions which are taken by the management might sometimes not be in the best interest of the company. So I think just because you are following good corporate governance and because you are a good group, you will create value. Uh, you know, the answer is definitely not 100%. Uh, to Mr. You know, Yatrik's uh, view on this 279 companies, I think we are, we are doing a post facto analysis. Can we say that which are the 279 companies after 10 years? Can we list the 279 companies which will, there, which will be there in 2026 <laughs> and 2016? Mm -hmm. We can't do that. So what we are doing is we are taking the top 279 companies. So obviously the reason that they are the top 279 companies is because they had good profits, good ROC and so on and so forth and not vice versa. So there's always a, a sort of a survival bias to any, any analysis which has been done on a hindsight. Now coming to whether quarterly numbers matter, frankly they do matter. They should not matter as much. But as I said, we are in a dynamic world where information is available for free and more than what we want. You know, so we have so many TV channels, we have so many experts coming on TV, including us who keep, keep on giving all sorts of gyan uh, on a daily basis. <laughs> because everyone has to sound intelligent mm. also. Uh, so they do impact uh, in the, in the mm. near term. Uh, at the same time, you know, there are pluses also of analyzing on a quarterly basis because we have seen trends in the same sector. Even mm. if you take IT, you could actually see the trend on a quarter on quarter basis. All the major IT companies, no one can dispute, have the best corporate governance, have the best disclosures, including TCS, uh, Wipro, HCL Tech, Infosys. But year on year, the differential in their performance both on the operational front as well as the stock market perspective have been phenomenal. You know, one year TCS went up by 50%, Infosys were down. This year Infosys was up 30-40%, TCS has not been performing. So we can argue that on a 10-year basis everyone has created value. But the fact is that this quarterly numbers do give you some perspective of the direction which the management is following to take the company on the growth path consistently. 
because as I said earlier, you know, mm -hmm. things are dynamic. So I think uh, just to summarize, you know, compliance, governance, everything is very, very important. But you can't disregard uh, the fact that the management has to be on their toes on a day-to-day -day basis, the way each one of us have to be on our toes on a day-to-day -day basis. So the quarterly reporting keeps them on their toes. Uh, yeah, it, it, it uh, mm. you know, formalizes the accountability. The accountability. Mm. Paul? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't really disagree with, with anything everybody said. I'd, I'd just add that I think corporate boards have a huge amount mm. to uh, offer here, that uh, if management is feeling pressured by quarter over quarter earnings announcements, um, then there is something wrong effectively mm. with the link between the corporate board and management. Uh, because if management and the board is a one on what the long-term strategy mm. is, and the indicators as to whether management is achieving that long-term strategy mm. or not, um, then management shouldn't be uh, disconcerted by quarter over quarter mm. earnings dips. Um, and nor should investors, again, if management is doing its job to communicate correctly. Mm. So I think a lot of these issues around quarterly earnings uh, really point to a lack of, of communication between investors and management and management and boards. Uh, and I think that is much more relevant to address than saying we should go from quarterly numbers to half yearly numbers. Um, I mean, at the Institute, we believe more information is always better than less information. Uh, it's what you do with that information that's important. And um, I think that's where you know, the rubber meets the road mm. as far as these things are concerned, is, is what do you do with that information? How do you explain that information? Um, you also need to put the, the antithesis, is, is if we went back to half yearly reporting, I think as Sunil absolutely correctly pointed out, that allows management far too much leeway mm -hmm. in terms of its accountability towards its uh, investors. And the reason we have quarterly reporting is that half yearly reporting didn't work. Um, we, we forget that. So, so in our survey, we asked this question whether uh, who uh, who is the most important, like who creates this pressure? And the answer was number one, CEO, number two, board, number three, investor. So that's very interesting. Uh, that's what the CFO is saying, which, which uh, is what you also said, that if the board is with you, then you should not have to worry too much about it. So I want to open this now. Uh, we've discussed a few things uh, uh, by asking the audience, anybody in the audience, uh, uh, whether uh, uh, they worry about, uh, Amit is raising his hands, but he's not a CFO yet, so <laughs> I will pass him. So, uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so I'll come to you, Amit. So, uh, so uh, you know, how do you look at this issue in your, uh, yes, yeah, sir? If you can just introduce yourself, uh, Mike, please. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Bhavin Asar, uh, working for a company called Perigo. It's an American uh, pharmaceutical company. And uh, we are in India for the last five years, and uh, probably in India now we are a victim of this uh, quarter to quarter uh, reporting, you know. So. Uh, uh, just wanted to, I, 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 I heard uh, what Jairaj has said and I think I agree with him that the quarter to quarter reporting is an indicator for an investor to understand what is going on in a company, but really for the management of the company or a promoter of a company to look at on quarter to quarter basis is uh, not a right thing because they know what are they into and what is a long term perspective. For example, there are a long term justice period projects, etc. And if everything has been looked on quarter to quarter basis, it becomes very difficult to, you know, uh, 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 manage the things. I was wondering and wanted to understand from esteemed panel that is there any research available which says that quarter to quarter basis people have taken the decision which has turned out not to be a right decision and they have and you know increase the long term value of the companies, you know. Very interesting question. Very interesting question. Is there a data? Is there data? Uh, so if we don't have answers, we will go back and find the answer. It's it's important to ask the right questions. So, but maybe they already have the answer. So I will just. Yeah, yeah. From a portfolio investor's perspective, we make more mistakes than we go right. So, <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I think there is uh, there are times when there is overreaction, and I'll give you a recent example. There was a new see the problem is as I said, there is too much information. And information is coming to all of us at the same time, and all of us want to react in the same direction. 
and that's why you have this huge volatility globally. You know, there was no reason for oil to fall twenty-eight dollars and in one month up seventy percent. You know, I know there were no buyers at thirty dollars. Now there are no sellers at even seventy dollars. So we all want to react at the same time on the same news, and that is where this volatility comes in. And from our perspective, it's an opportunity also. So I think if you are very clear about the long-term potential and the long-term, uh, even the decision-making capability of the management. You mentioned about long gestation projects. If they are communicated well, then at least the portfolio investors are aware uh, that this project is going to take three years, four years, and so on and so forth. So a recent example, there was a news flash about Lupin Laboratories, which is in the pharma space. And there was some 483 from US FDA. And the stock price from some 1600 fell to 1300. Within two days, it was back to almost 1600. You know, so I think uh, there will always be opportunities where, if you have done your homework properly and you know your subject in detail, you will use this as opportunities. But if you are super flaws and you know you're just depending on news flow, you will end up on the on the wrong side of trade. So there have been a lot of. Uh, uh, from a portfolio perspective, a lot of instances where there has been overreaction. From a management perspective, I think seasoned management will not get swayed by quarterly swings. But then what is very important, at least from a market perspective, is that communication has to be very clear. So if you are able to communicate properly that, you know, why this quarter has been uh, uh, sort of below par, or if there is a significant, uh, you can say, beat on a quarter. You know, you don't pump up the expectation, but measure the expectation, because it might be a one-off kind of a quarter. Then this volatility can reduce, and that would put less pressure even on the management. So as Paul said, you know, if the board, the CEO, and the management team are in sync, <coughs> then the pressure of reacting on a quarter basis on the management will be much less. And from an investor's perspective, if that is communicated properly, then even from an investor's perspective, the pressure would be much less. And as Vidhu mentioned, the bigger pressure is from the CEO rather than the investors, you know. I, would like to I think there's also a, um, a structure issue in the market. I was talking to Yatrik earlier on, and, and as I understand it, the Indian market is 60% owned by retail investors. Um, in the US, uh, somewhere between 70 and 75% In the US, um, somewhere between 70 and 75% of the market is owned by institutional investors. In China, um, well over 60% of the market is owned by retail uh, investors. Uh, Paul, just to correct, he was talking about the trading turnover, not the ownership. Ownership is only 9% retail. Well, tra so ownership same, was only 9% right, retail. But the same, same point is that the, the volume of transactions uh, is um, uh, in some markets is prone to be more volatile than in other markets because of the type of investor that's investing. If you look at, um, if you look at a professional fund manager's ability to outperform here in India, as opposed to a professional fund manager's ability to outperform in North America, for instance, um, the opportunity is vastly different because of the shape of the market. And I think that's an important point to make is that a lot of the volatility that's generated by quarter over quarter numbers is not necessarily smart volatility. Uh, and so you do have to look at the way the markets are structured to, to sort of think that through as well. Uh, so. Yeah. A yeah. number of questions Hello. coming up here. Yeah. yeah. My name is Satya Tripathi. I work with Hindustan Construction Company. I just have a thought to share, not a question. Basically, we are assuming that quarterly report reporting, and I would also like to add one more bit to it, that there are corporate announcements which are a bit get shared with the investing community or the external stakeholders. But there are, uh, there is a view that, you know, whatever the management or the promoter is doing is the best, which may not always be correct. So this reporting really is a way to get the feedback from the market. And I would like to support this view from the point of view in Indian context, like, when Disco acquired Boris or Indalco acquired Novelis, the market was against the, the opinion because they were introducing a huge amount of risk by way of introducing this is leverage buyouts. And now, over a period of time, now we can see very, very clearly that Disco has destroyed a lot of value. 
the market was the, on the right side by punishing those kind of acquisitions, which the management should have taken note of. But they've ignored and their own wisdom, they've gone ahead. So I think this is a course correction mechanism also. And reporting in a way does a lot of uh, value addition in the periodic reporting of the corporate announcement. That's the thought I thought I should put it on. Thanks. But there may be uh, examples of the other sort as well, where the uh, market didn't like it, but later uh, the acquisition went well. Do, does anybody know of such cases? Uh, we'll come back to that. Uh, uh, Udenji, you had a question? Uh, no? OK. I thought you raised your hand. Yeah. Uh, coming to, uh, uh, I'm Jigar from Rolta. Uh, uh, and uh, the thing is on the quarterly reportings, probably we see, especially into the IT sector, the expectation sets for every quarter. I, I believe all this quarterly reporting, uh, setting of expectations probably puts a lot of pressure on the management. And we have seen in case of Satyam, it also leads to frauds. So I think probably with this whole pressure of quarterly reporting, uh, in a race to prove that we are better, we are market leaders, I think there is a significant, um, I would say, not an, uh, there is a significant uh, risk uh, of uh, actually frauds happening, even though Satyam was rated as the best corporate governance company that year mm -hmm. itself, mm -hmm. right? Hmm. In spite of having the best corporate governance, it's just, just this race, the pressure of uh, proving that we are best in, or we will, uh, our rankings do not shift of, on a quarter on quarter basis. It is leading to probably uh, uh, bad practices uh, into the industry. And that puts, I think that puts tremendous pressure on the CFOs. And obviously uh, it's, uh, so I, I don't think so. This is the right kind of an environment, at, at, especially for a developing economy like India, to have so much pressure on a quarterly basis if you want to perform on a long-term basis. So under pressure, you could take a wrong, a decisions. wrong decision. And, yeah. but, but that says something about the management right. and the culture that they create. So, yeah, so that's yeah, what you're yeah, again, right, yeah. uh, in the case of Satyam, yeah. probably mm -hmm. we were talking about the best management, right? That, you know, but if... Yeah, it was yeah. wrong later mm -hmm. on, mm -hmm. but on number of quarters, I think, they have been doing this thing for the last, what, five to six years? And unless Mr. Raju himself did not confess, and I don't know how many such kind of companies still exist in India and when this bubble can burst. And it could be a big blow to the economy. Amit, uh, you know, just you wanted to say something. Hi, Amit Chakravarti from CFA Institute. Uh, from a pure investor's perspective, like you know, uh, the, the basic definition of short term versus long term, and the answer that I got from this forum was it depends. Now, how do you communicate this it depends thing to investors? How do you explain this? Sorry. Yeah. It, it what I'm asking is like you know, uh, no. the, 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 the summary of the discussion, the definition of long term is that it depends right, on the situation, on the company, on the sector. So how do you communicate this, it depends, message to the retail investors? Yeah, I think... Uh, when you also have to communicate to your, um, your shareholders, right? Yes. Uh, so. I think uh, it's all about communication because uh, while on one hand you have financial numbers to be published quarter on quarter, but most of the businesses now have a very transparent communication. They have the... Uh, uh, press meets and they have the guidances and so on and so forth. So as part of those uh, uh, discussions and announcements and including the uh, entire uh, the latest report in the balance sheet, uh, I have seen all the progressive good companies, uh, they definitely have a very vital part in their discussions and disclosures around what kind of long-term vision the company has and what are the broad plans. They may not have uh, last uh, percentage-based statistics, but they definitely give a good amount of direction. So that uh, within investing community also, see there are two or three aspects that we must all realize is that uh, there would be a class of investors who are very short-term driven, but there are a uh, large set of investors in the company who believe that they want to stay put for a longer period of time. So if we communicate well and most of the good companies, at least top 50 companies, which are part of our Nifty, 
I find that uh, there is a lot of communication that they do. So, it is not either or, but it is actually both that the promoters and the companies have to do with the shareholders. That's a I think uh, I mean, from a retail investor's perspective, long term has to be five years. There is no doubt about it. I think uh, the discussion is basically on how the company as the in and the you know, institutional investor is viewing it. So, uh, you know, while analyzing a company, you have to take care of the long term. But you just can't ignore the near term because the near term will ultimately reinforce your view on the company from a longer term perspective. But from a retail investor, you know, the retail investor is taking a call on the asset class. The retail investor is not supposed to be taking a call on individual companies. So I think the, the call from the retail investors is very clear. If the economy is growing, if money is to be made in the equity market, stay put. You know, I think uh, the day-to-day -day participants will take care of, uh, you know, which company is to be invested or not invested. You know, I'll again give you an example. There was this company called Aishar Motors. You know, now everyone is giving the company awards for the best corporate governance, best returns. The company's stock price has moved up 200 times over the last five years. And, you know, after launching more motorcycles in India, now they are targeting the world and taking, taking on Harley Davidson and so on and so forth. Six, seven years back, you know, it was supposed to be the most poor corporate governance company in India. They had a bike which no one used to buy. They sold the tractor division. The company was struggling and so on and so forth. So I think. Things change, management change, uh, you know, the way, uh, uh, you know, the company starts to look at the future change. Sometimes luck also ha uh, helps, you know, you launch a product and it, it basically uh, uh, does well. And even from a company's perspective, as you know, Yatrik mentioned, every company has a long-term vision. Now, if Apple is going to launch a car, if they start working now, the car will be launched after five years. You know, Tesla recently did record bookings for a car they're going to launch after three years. So I think they're all very vocally communicating uh, their long-term uh, sort of goals. So I think companies that way are very clear. Now, Sunil, I mean, my uh, question was like, you know, uh, if, so if it is five years or three years or seven years, uh, just like in the mutual fund industry now, we see a lot of um, advertising about why people should invest in a mutual fund and like, you know, doing SIPs is a good thing and stuff like that. So from, a, um, from purely investing in the equity markets, I don't really see a lot of like you know stuff going around which is explaining what is long term, why people should stay invested for five years, six years, seven years, and not be a, a trader on a day-to-day -day basis. So I mean, while people discuss this on maybe like private forums and smaller gatherings, I don't see a, a like you know a, a mass media around this. Is is what I'm saying? I think you need a, a good wealth manager. <laughs> <laughs> There are a lot of efforts, you know, I at least do 100, 150, I don't know how many mm. uh, events in a year. Uh, the industry also does a lot. Uh, on the billboards, you can only put so much, you know, you can't have mm. a, a billboard which looks like a newspaper. So mm. the advertisements have to be crisp, they're expensive also. Uh, but there are a lot of events organized by mutual funds, by insurance companies, by um, private wealth guys, relationship managers, brokers. Uh, NSC has uh, uh, a series of programs which uh, used to be there on NSC, on, on, on one of the news channels. Uh, uh, so, you know, I think all, all the participants are uh, very, very open. In fact, uh, MFI, which is Association of Mutual Funds of India, has a big budget this year. Which they will be, uh, and so all these ads of systematic investment plans and you know are all uh, due to those efforts. So, you wanted well, to ask? Can I just so, can yeah. I just throw something yeah, yeah. Out, out as well? I mean, it's it's um, it's very interesting in in um, uh, North America, for instance, that the number of quoted companies, and I think it speaks to this, have has declined by something like thirty five percent over mm -hmm. the last twenty years as companies have privatized themselves. Secondly, uh, the equity markets are now in, very unlikely to be used for uh, capital raising for long-term mm -hmm. projects. Mm -hmm. um, the West now depends much more on debt capital than on equity capital for financing long-term mm -hmm. investments. And as a, um, a foreigner, I'd like to know, you know, from a CFO perspective as well, um, what that means here in India are the debt markets functioning properly because this is this is not just about equity investing. I mean, I think the uh, companies in uh, other parts of the world are reacting 
to the dysfunction of equity markets by either privatizing or by issuing debt capital. And I think that's uh, an interesting development that isn't, is, is perhaps very inimical to Sunil's business, uh, and, but is quite interesting globally that the phenomenon is, is very much to react to short-term trading, is to, is to take companies private or to, uh, or to issue other forms of debt. So, so you're saying that... So I what are CFOs mean, doing about that in India? I mean, is there a functioning corporate debt market? Are mm. CFOs beginning to switch the way that they raise capital going forward for long-term projects? Is that, is that something that people think about? Vijay, do you want to say something about it? Uh, uh, well, uh, whether uh, companies will go for more debt or more equity will be a function of the situation at that point in time, and it depends on a variety of factors. Uh, one of the major factor maybe is that there are some people who believe that uh, business should be done on your own funds. There are some other people who believe that business should be done on somebody else's funds. So, uh, <laughs> so <laughs> there is an issue of tax shield as well. Uh, mm -hmm. But having said that, uh, to an extent in India, uh, there is a herd mentality as well. If, if, if you find that the primary market is doing very well in India, then you will suddenly find that a uh, series of public issues will come and people will raise money through uh, mm -hmm. primary capital market. Otherwise, they will go back and uh, raise their money through debt, which is a function, again, of uh, interest rates. So it all depends on how the economy is growing and how the capital markets are behaving at that point in time. Yeah, and I think one more dimension to capital raising behavior in India specifically is that that since uh, uh, people think in India that uh, equity capital is free, there is zero cost to equity, so people uh, prefer to raise equity. The, the, the CFOs yeah. need to <laughs> so the CFOs need to take CFA exam or uh, <laughs> interesting. So you know, I want to close. Uh, we have another five minutes. So uh, by asking what can we do as a community, because that's what we are here for. So we've uh, highlighted a few issues. Um, and uh, we know that, uh, that we need to protect the equity markets from becoming dysfunctional. So what is it that we can do together? Because the Institute uh, uh, regularly does these kind of conversations, bring people together from uh, different professions, uh, look at a problem from different angles, and then uh, come up with something which makes sense for everybody, for policymakers, regulators, and so on. And that's the way we try to contribute. So I want to quickly go around the panel and ask, what do you think you can, we can do as a community, and who can do what? If you can just uh, think about it for a minute. And it's a little difficult question, but I think uh, it's the question of the mindset change first, to my mm -hmm. mind. And this is a great beginning towards that, that yes, we all have to look at long-term value creation. And therefore, we are talking about an environment to be built. So environment, to my mind, has to be internal as well as external. Mm. So internal, when you talk about it is between within the company, which is people, process, technology, as to how a company is building an environment of for people, for the processes, and for the technology. Because these are the three pillars which I believe can be the creators for value in the long term. The external environment which we talked about is about the awareness, the education, and the differentiation that one has to make, or the context in which one has to look at as to what is long-term and what is short-term. And that external environment can be probably further supplemented with whatever kind of surveys or any kind of measuring index, or I do not know what kind of other sort of parameters that the institute or the academicians can think about to really measure uh, based on past data as well as certain other data or information which is more qualitative than merely the data available from the balance sheets. Because when we look at the people part of it, that may not be put in value terms from a company's perspective in the balance sheet, similarly the technology aspect or the process aspect. So where are those indices or those uh, statistics which one can analyze and gather to really measure a, a, a company which is moving towards value creation. So, for example, I'm just giving this example not with a view to give a name, but Reliance Geo or Reliance Retail, which are the two classic businesses for which uh, the uh, from a 
analyst perspective or an investor perspective, everybody has been apprehensive that these projects have got delayed and they have long gestation period, they have taken too long, the cost of uh, setting up these projects have gone extremely long. And both the businesses, if you see the geo business has been sort of being in the setup phase for almost four years. And the retail business started in 2006, almost 10 years now. And still nobody sees a value in the real sense that one looks at from an investor perspective while the management thinks that we are there to create value. So is, are there indicators available from the data and information to really with the management or the promoter here is creating value? I don't think such indicators are truly available and therefore an effort in that direction could probably help proper decision making by whichever stakeholder, be it government, be it the financing institutions, be it the investors who are putting the money in the company or be it the mutual fund investors, uh, mutual fund manager themselves. That's what I think. So what can we do as a community? Yeah. I think the CFP Institute and the local society has already been quite active. Uh, I think the regulators have done quite a lot in India. So if you see the Kumar Mangalam corporate governance uh, report, which started the disclosure norms as far as corporate governance is concerned, uh, the SEBI's uh, take on uh, you know uh, uh, proxy voting compulsory, proxy voting and making disclosures compulsory, the Ministry of Corporate Affairs, uh, you know, enforcing the majority of minority rule, where the majority shareholder or the, or the management shareholder could not vote on resolutions which had uh, some, uh, you know, so-called benefit to them. Uh, and even, uh, you know, exchanges the way they have been pretty active in, in uh, you know, delisting companies or warning investors by shifting them to their category, so on and so forth. Uh, however, uh, I think that uh, you know one one beginning which we did earlier. I remember when we had a, a training session for journalists. I think uh, uh, I personally feel that we as a community should be focusing a lot on that because you know we are all talking about how retail uh, investors or traders uh, uh, are always on the wrong side because they're not as sort of uh, you can say aware or knowledgeable. And that is where media plays a big role because a lot of these news, gossip, rumors uh, get analyzed by very competent reporters but maybe not uh, as financially qualified as you would all like to be. So I think that is one space where uh, at least I feel that we as a community can, can focus which will improve the whole ecosystem. Paul, you have to give scholarships to the reporters. Um, well, we do have, we do have, um, it's not a joke, we do have scholarships for reporters. Um, and so we need to spread that word. As uh, Sunil said, we, we're passionately interested in educating uh, journalists um, and, and regulators. In fact, we have a scholarship program for regulators as well um, because it's important that this financial literacy issue is, is absolutely vital to the proper functioning of the market. And I'd, I'd come back to Vijay's opening remarks. I think it's all about uh, communication. And I think the three pillars, Vijay, that you pointed out are the ones that we have to explain to people, uh, corporate governance, uh, and then secondly, having an edge that you invest in, uh, and then thirdly, being consistent. That's what makes a great company, and I totally agree with that. And it's up to us to explain that, to keep explaining it, and to make sure that everybody uh, across the system, investors, journalists, regulators, uh, professionals, C CFOs, CEOs, board governors, um, understand all of that. And within the investment community, fiduciary responsibility and the promotion of uh, that uh, idea? Definitely. I mean, it's other people's money at the yeah. end of the day. And we, we should never forget that as investment professionals, that it's not our money. Uh, it's other people's money. We're stewards of that capital uh, and we're trying to provide uh, the best return that we can um, for those investors. And that is always the case to invest in the best companies, whether you do that through the, the debt markets or the equity markets, you're looking for the companies that distinguish themselves, I think, as, as Vijay outlined. Vijay, what can we do as a community? Uh, well, any community related improvement starts from self. So, uh, I would divide that self in two uh, parts, uh, one on the part of the investee companies, uh, and those investee companies can include even mutual funds and insurance companies as well, where the investors are investing. Uh, on their part, they should be more transparent about what they actually display uh, in terms of either their quarterly results or uh, 
you know, including the advertisements. Uh, because more often than not, a common investor like me is more worried about that star which is there in the advertisement, which says that the terms and conditions apply uh, for anything and everything. Uh, so if the transparency goes up, then you are serving the community uh, to a great extent, invest, investing community. And on the part of uh, investor, uh, whatever said and done, and given the busy uh, and the tight schedule that most of the investors have uh, at the retail level particularly, they should be encouraged to go more towards investing into mutual funds, and I'm advertising for him. Uh, they should be... <laughs> They should be going towards <laughs> more towards uh, mutual funds and insurance. And uh, as 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 uh, Yatrik mentioned, that if we can reduce the participation of retail investors into the market uh, in a direct manner, then possibly we will uh, 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 we will be able to have a capital market which is which is a source for wealth creation for the nation as a well, whole uh, into more matured. Uh, situation. Last word. Yeah, I think uh, as uh, Sunil was mentioning that uh, the framework is in place in terms of lawmakers or regulators or to a large extent even exchanges. So what we need to do going forward from here is that uh, on corporate side, maybe the disclosures could be much more uh, robust around uh, value creation. Maybe there could be some uh, mandated disclosures required even on quarter on quarter basis or yearly basis and on the other hand uh, is spreading the financial literacy because the important statistic that uh, we must understand that whatever are the markets today and the volume today in India we are still far far behind any global standard because today as you may look at it the direct indirect that is both uh, direct as well as mutual fund route the total participation of uh, people in our country to capital market is less than 5%. And when you look at the uh, European and American markets, it is somewhere between 15 to 20%. So as India, we have at least four times or five times opportunity as we move forward. So if you believe that, yes, India has a real good potential to grow in next 10, 10 years or 20 years, and if this participation will go to those double digit numbers, huge amount of work needs to be done around financial literacy. People must understand how different products work, what are the risks and rewards around all the products. I think that is, I think, a very important work that we as country we need to do. And I think the institute also may want to participate in that particular direction. Thank you very much, gentlemen. This was a very, very fine discussion, and we would like to continue this conversation with the larger group in different ways, handling, you, handing back to Anuradha. Thank you. It's, I think this is a fascinating start to a discussion that needs to continue. I do want to make one or two points. A lot of the conversation here has been focused on the markets and how markets reward companies and how that can drive behavior. Uh, the truth is that our economy today has an increasing number of companies that are outside of the market. Growth is actually being led by small and mid-sized companies which are very, very far away from a lot of the things that we are saying in this room. Uh, there is a parallel when you talk about larger disclosure, superior disclosure, better governance. The fact that I run a small company, 200, 250 people, we are 50 crores. The amount of time that my company has to spend in order to be well governed on just compliance and disclosure is ghastly. So there is a, you know, so the honest guy is still getting penalized in this country. The fraud is getting, the fraudster is still getting away. And I think we have a much larger problem to solve than for the Mahindras and the Tatas and the Birlas in this, in this country that are actually examples of how companies that are large conglomerates need to be run. So 
Of course, this debate needs to be going uh, to go on, and I think we do need to make it better and uh, you know make it uh, make it easier and also uh, facilitate the fact that the example that these conglomerates are setting are followed by a large number of companies that participate in the market. But I think as a community, we also need to think about in parallel what is going to drive similar behavior and outcomes in that large pool of companies that sit outside of the market. You know, private investment, funds, equity, all of this is becoming available today to companies that, as alternate channels of investment. If I sit and think about how I run my company and how difficult it is for me to go out and raise money, and then I look around me and there are these absolutely fly-by-night e-commerce companies that are raising tens and hundreds of crores every day, it really does make me worry and think about what drives the investor. So I think there's a lot of thinking to be done around this space. And you know, uh, the people with the money, if they're not going to think about the correct outcomes and the right way to invest or the right things to invest behind, um, I think this conflict is going to stay for a long time to come. So there is an even greater need for the bunch of us who want to think rightly about it and organizations that are actually pushing for the right behavior from an investment and value creation point of view, I think we have lots and lots and lots to do. So I look forward to continuing this conversation. Thank you so much for coming. And thank you to our panel for an absolutely outstanding discussion. Thank you.